Typhoon Kanun is bringing torrential rain and strong winds to the Korean Peninsula. This has stopped the operation of trains and airplanes and closed schools nationwide while also causing flooding and landslides. The capital and surrounding areas are expected to bear the brunt of the storm tonight. China has lifted a ban on group tours to South Korea six years after the so-called bad retaliation. This as Beijing announces a major shift in its travel restriction policy to a host of countries, including the U.S., imposed during the COVID pandemic. The nation's state-run think tank projects South Korea's economy to expand to 1.5%, keeping the rate the same as before, citing some improvements in construction, investment and exports. It's August 10th, 2023. This is News Center. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yoon Jung Min. We start with the latest on Typhoon Kanun that's slamming the country with heavy rain and strong winds since making landfall this morning. Our Song Yoo Jin is standing by, who's been closely monitoring the typhoon's progress. Yoo Jin, um, how's the storm looking from where you are? Yes, hello, Jongmin. I'm currently on the east coast of the country in the city of Donghae, Gangwon-do province. Now, I can say that since early morning, it's been heavy rain and strong winds all day long. Now, regions like this, located in the eastern part of the Gangwon-do province, has been receiving heavy rainfall of up to 300 millimeters starting yesterday until today afternoon. And I, we could really feel that the typhoon is approaching as this particular region has been battered by another heavy rainfall of 80 millimeters per hour. Uh, rain has stopped a moment ago, but as you can see, strong winds. We're experiencing strong winds right now. It's really hard for me to stand still in one place because of the heavy winds. So yeah, we are experiencing heavy winds right now. And people here are bracing for more as a typhoon is expected to approach the Gangwon-do province sometime between 6 and 9 p.m. today. So under the influence of the typhoon, uh, the eastern part of the Gangwon-do province is expected to receive a whopping 6 600 millimeters of rainfall by Friday, which is the heaviest rain forecast in the country. Now, with this relentless rainfall, I really felt that there's really no point in wearing raincoats as well as carrying umbrellas when it is raining. And here, trees are wobbling and most stores nearby are closed. And I could see also police patrol cars out on the road to make sure people stay away from coastal areas as tall waves are violently crashing over seawalls. The weather conditions turn even more brutal after the typhoon made its expected landfall near the city of Koje, located in the Gyeongsangnam-do province at around 9.20 a.m. And after reaching the peninsula, it is moving upwards and will cut its way through the country. And the entire nation is expected to be under the typhoon's influence by tonight. Gusts are expected to reach up to 35 meters per second, which is strong enough to bring down trees and also derail trains. Right, um, extra caution needed there. And uh, Eugene, what sort of precautions have been in place? Right, so typhoon alerts have been issued nationwide since early morning and we're continuing to see landslide alerts being extended to other parts of the country now. And authorities are especially on high alert as we're bracing for heavier rains and strong windfalls as the typhoon is moving upwards in the country. Now, to really prevent um, any safety accidents and to ensure the safety of the people, more than 10,600 people nationwide have evacuated from their homes for safety. Also, more than 350 flights nationwide have been canceled. But it's not the, just the skies that have been affected. Railroad services and sea routes have been suspended, as well as roads and more than 600 hiking trails being closed. The Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasures Headquarters during its meeting this morning ordered the heads of local disaster headquarters to stand by around the clock until the typhoon passes the country. And it also stressed that those living in flood or landslide-prone areas uh, should be ready to evacuate immediately in case of an emergency. That's all I have for now. Back to you, Jongmin. That was our Song Yoo Jin reporting live. We also have our Yi Seung Min standing by at the Weather Center for the latest. Seung Min, bring us up to speed. Well, Song Min, Typhoon Kanun has drenched South Korea today, forcing roads and highway passes to close. If you take a look at the satellite imagery, the entire nation is vastly covered. Typhoon Kanun is moving unusually slowly, which means that it will stay in South Korea longer than expected. The relatively slow pace will also result in a substantial amount of rainfall. 
Typhoon Kanun made landfall in South Korea's southern city of Kolde early this morning. It is continuing to move north towards central inland regions. This means that Kanun is forecast to pass through vertically. It is set to head towards near the southeast of Seoul at around 10 p.m. tonight. As for tomorrow, although the amount of rainfall will subside a tad compared to today, it will still be heavy. Eastern Gangwon-do province will see torrential downpours of up to 300 millimeters. Chungcheong-do, Jeollabuk-do, and Gyeongsangbuk-do provinces will see up to 200 millimeters. The Seoul metropolitan area and the surrounding regions will see about 150. Rain will come with gusty winds as well. The coastlines of Gyeongsangdo province in particular will see strong winds gusting as fast as 40 meters per second. Earlier today, cars were damaged by signboards and bricks blown by strong winds. Please take extra precautions and secure any items that could get blown away. That's all I have for you this hour, and I'll be back with more updates later in the newscast. Jungmin. And multiple reports of damage and some casualties from the storm have started to come in. And for more, our E. Dae-hyun is standing by on the line with the latest. Lehyun, do fill us in. Yes, Jungmin, reports on casualties are continuing to arrive with one person killed in Daegu. A 67-year-old man was found in cardiac arrest at around 12.30 after being swept away by flood water. He was moved to a nearby hospital but reportedly died there. In addition, a man in his 60s was reported missing also in Daegu at around 1.45 after he apparently fell into a ditch from a wheelchair. Emergency authorities are currently conducting a search for him. They also received at least 20 calls for help from areas around the city near the Nakdong River prior to midday. Meanwhile, at around 9.45 a.m. in Gyeongsan of Gyeongsangbukdo province, a woman was rescued from her car that had been caught in flood water. A further 18 people were also rescued from flooding in the province. Now, the city of Busan is also seeing some damage with some roads in Heundegu inundated by tidal surges. The city's fire department said it had received 239 emergency calls so far, but added that there had not been as much damage as in previous typhoons. No casualties were reported from Busan's be beaches as police had closed off access roads in advance. In Jeollanamdo province, the fire department answered 21 calls in the morning reporting damage, including window frames being blown out in Yeosu and a possible collapse of houses due to landslides in Sinangun County. Damage to farmland was also reported, and some apartment buildings were without power. Gangwon-do province is also seeing a heavy rain, with emergency alerts being issued to residents. As of 12 p.m., 105 calls related to the typhoon have been received at the fire department's headquarters, leading the authorities to conduct two rescues, issue three evacuation orders, and investigate 20 safety issues regarding building damage. Emergency officials in Chungcheongbukdo province and said they had received 53 calls as of 1 p.m. And, and had ordered the evacuation of 30 residents due to flooding. Some roads were blocked by fallen trees and sinkholes had emerged on others. Now, now the typhoon is expected to land in Seoul in the evening at around 9 p.m. as it continues to slowly head north. To ease traffic congestion, Seoul City will increase the frequency of public transportation, including subways and buses during commuting hours. That's all I have for this hour, but I'll be back with more updates in the later newscast. China has decided to lift its travel ban on group tours to a total of 78 countries, including South Korea. Seoul welcomes the move, hoping to bring Chinese group tours back to the country after more than six years since the so-called THAAD retaliation. Kim Mogan reports. For the first time in six years and five months, the Chinese government has given the green light for group tours to South Korea. In an announcement made on Thursday, China's culture ministry lifted its ban on group tours to 78 countries, which also includes the U.S. and Japan. It explained that its previous decisions to ease travel restrictions in January and March this year had a positive impact on its tourism industry. At that time, China was allowing group travel to a total of 60 countries following a decision to scrap its zero-COVID measures. However, South Korea was not on the list, with group tours to Korea banned from March 2017 in an apparent retaliation for the country's deployment of the U.S.-made Terminal High Altitude Area Defense, or the THAAD system. The South Korean government welcomes the move, saying it will launch efforts to attract more Chinese tourists. 
Seoul's culture ministry says it expects the latest announcement to bring life back to the nation's tourism industry, which was hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic. To make things more convenient, the government plans to open new visa application centers in Beijing and Shenyang. It had already began resuming its no visa transfer system for Chinese group tourists to Jeju Island in May. Meanwhile, procedures for Korean tourists applying for Chinese visas will also be simplified. Until the end of 2023, Korean people heading to China for tourism and travel purposes will no longer be required to provide fingerprints. Kim mo Arirang News. The presidential office has Thursday named two new deputy presidential spokespersons. Both have been part of the UN administration since the election campaign. Lawyer Choi Ji-hyun was a deputy spokesperson during UN's transition committee and was most recently part of UN's legal affairs team. Kim ki hyun is a former broadcast journalist and has been part of the communications team since the campaign. Most recently, he was the assistant secretary to the spokesperson. Presidential spokesperson Yi Lee Do-un says this will boost communication between the press and the top office, as the media are familiar with the two deputies. The role of deputy spokesperson has been vacant for four months. South Korea's economy is expected to expand 1.5 percent. That's according to the Korea Development Institute, keeping the rate unchanged from its earlier estimate. It suggests some signs of improvements in the economy while revising upwards its forecast for inflation due to rising oil prices. Her Lee Soo-jin tells us more. The Korea Development Institute has maintained its economic outlook estimate for this year at 1.5 percent. In its revised forecast published on Thursday, the South Korean state-run economic think tank kept its outlook unchanged from its estimate released in May. Its estimate for next year was also kept at 2.3 percent. The economic growth in the first half of 2023 was in line with the KDI's forecast and we expect the economy to recover at a similar pace during the second half as well. The KDI, which typically releases economic outlook comprehensive reports in May and November, this year released two additional revised forecasts in February and August to reflect the rapidly changing economic conditions. The KDI's forecast is the same as the OECD's estimate, but higher than that of the South Korean government's, the Bank of Korea's, and the IMF's of 1.4 percent. The KDI said it maintained its economic outlook for this year as the South Korean economy is expected to see recovery driven by the manufacturing sector as exports of vehicles and chips continue to show improvement. Experts of goods are also expected to be boosted by the steady growth seen in the U.S. economy, which is expected to offset the impact of China's economic slowdown. Exports of goods exceeded the forecast mainly thanks to vehicle exports in the first half of the year. For the year, it is expected to rise to 1.4 percent, surpassing the previous forecast of 0.7 percent. In regards to consumer inflation, the KDI revised upward its forecast for the year to 3.5 percent from 3.4 percent on the back of higher oil prices. The price of Dubai crude oil this year rose from an average of 76 U.S. dollars per barrel to 81 dollars. Concerns about external factors remain, however. The think tank said that recovery may be delayed if China's economic slump worsens from its real estate crisis or if global inflation rises, leading to countries tightening monetary policies. Lee Soo-jin, Arirang News. U.S. President Joe Biden signed an executive order on Wednesday local time that will prohibit some U.S. investment into China's quantum computing, advanced semiconductors and artificial intelligence sectors and require firms investing in other tech sectors to notify the government. The order is aimed at preventing American capital and expertise from helping China develop technologies that could support its military modernization and undermine U.S. national security. In response, the Chinese Chinese Commerce Ministry said on Thursday that it was gravely concerned about the order and that it reserves the right to take corresponding measures. South Korea said the same day that the latest ban is expected to have a limited impact on Korean companies.
North Korean leader Kim Jong-un ordered an aggressive posture for war preparations during a military meeting escalating tensions on the Korean Peninsula ahead of Seoul-Washington joint exercises later this month. What's notable was he's pointing at the South Korean capital on a map in a released photo. Choi Min-jung has more on what this means. A photo released by North Korea state-run media shows its leader Kim Jong-un pointing at the South Korean capital and the surrounding areas on a map. Speaking at a meeting of the Central Military Commission on Wednesday, Kim called on his regime to prepare for the possibility of war in an offensive manner. The regime's Korean Central News Agency reported on Thursday that Kim stressed the need to expand mass production of weapons. He also reportedly highlighted the importance of a strong army to carry out its military strategy. In addition, the leader called for the military to expand its drills to keep its forces perfectly ready for combat. Experts say the meeting was held as a show of discontent against Seoul and Washington's annual Ulchi Freedom Shield exercise set to take place later this month. In the past, North Korea responded to Seoul-Washington drills by firing short-range ballistic missiles. However, this time, they have shown that they are preparing for war. Given this, tensions on the Korean peninsula are expected to rise considerably. During the meeting, Kim also replaced his top general Park Su-il with Lee Young-gil, who previously served as the regime's defense minister. Lee young has a lot of real-life experience with regard to defense, security and artillery. So hiring experienced personnel like this appears to be a strategic move to prepare firmly against South Korea's Ulti Freedom Shield exercise with the U.S. Also discussed in the meeting was North Korea's preparation for a military parade on September 9th to mark the regime's 75th founding anniversary. Given the prior notice, pundits say the scale of the parade is likely to be considerably big. Choi min Arirang News. For the past couple of weeks, South Korea has been battling extreme heat as countries around the world battle adverse weather conditions. This has prompted more people to look for financial protection against the extreme heat and rain, what's called disaster insurance. Our Moon hye went out to investigate this trend and the current underlying issues. When you think of extreme weather conditions, what image comes to mind? With the heat wave that's been gripping the country for the past two weeks, insurance companies and the government are working to provide financial support and compensation for damage that's been wrought by the weather, not just limited to flooding. This insurance company has recently released a new insurance package that's been garnering attention amid the increasing number of heat-related illnesses like heat stroke, as it covers health problems specific to different seasons. You can receive 300,000 Korean won, or roughly 228 US dollars, with this insurance plan if you are diagnosed with a heat-related illness such as heat stroke or heat exhaustion at a hospital or general medical practice. But it's not just people that are suffering in this weather. Livestock such as the goats here have also been affected. Extreme heat causes them to become more aggressive and prone to fights among themselves due to stress. Combined with the physical effects of heat such as loss of appetite, the heat wave has resulted in losses that farmers with smaller farms have been unable to be compensated for. Many goat farms in South Korea are run on a small scale, so we can't join the Disaster Livestock Insurance Plan. The current Disaster Livestock Insurance Plan in South Korea is run and regulated by the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. And bee farmers too have found issues with it during their battle with the heat as bees die from being unable to regulate temperatures inside melting hives. Although bees are on the list of livestock that can be covered by the Livestock Insurance Plan, it's impossible for us to claim compensation because unlike cattle, we can't count the number of bees that have died. It's also not like all the bees die here. Some will die away from the hive. The heat wave follows weeks of heavy downpours which cause damage to farmland and farm buildings, such as at this chicken farm. It's also far more humid this summer as a result of the rain, which means that diseases are being passed around more easily, as well as rendering water cooling systems like this useless. Diseases like avian influenza are covered by the government insurance, but there are a lot of infectious diseases like the IBD that chickens are prone to that aren't. 
So I visited the Agricultural Ministry to find out more about the current insurance plans available to these farmers. This plan was first made available in 1997 and has since come to include 16 different categories of livestock, including cattle, pigs, chickens and sheep. The number of farms that have applied for this insurance has grown steadily over the years but grew exponentially in 2022, with the number of farms signed up to this insurance jumping by nearly 50%. The government is well aware of the problems raised by farmers and plans to implement necessary changes. We currently cover the primary effects of natural disasters like heavy rain or heat waves. But we're also running a trial with insurance policies to cover infectious diseases among livestock by starting with cattle from 2021 until next year. With climate change having a global impact, the ministry is benchmarking insurance policies abroad. Disaster insurance is becoming important as a result of more frequent adverse weather conditions. That's why we're monitoring insurance plans in countries where this is already well developed, like the United States, to help improve our own. As countries continue to grapple with the intensifying effects of global warming, collaboration across borders to provide financial protection for people and livestock affected will become increasingly crucial. Moon Haryan, Arirang News. The entire nation is currently under the influence of Typhoon Kanun. The current radar map indicates how dispersed the rain clouds are, bringing heavy rain across much of South Korea. The entire nation will be lashed by torrential downpours until tomorrow morning. The ground is already very weak and saturated from previous downpours, so please take extra precautions beforehand to prevent any further damages. While temperatures will stay in a similar range for Seoul at 28 degrees Celsius tomorrow, other regions will see hot spells returning. After the rain tapers off tomorrow daytime, a surge of hot air mass will bring temperatures to near 30 degrees Celsius. Places like Gangneung will see highs jumping by about 6 degrees. And morning temperatures will be ranging from 23 to 26 degrees nationwide. For the daytime, Seoul and Chuncheon will see lingering showers. Highs in Seoul will get up to 28, Daejeon 29, Gyeongju will be hot at 34 degrees. After the rain subsides for central regions, summer-like conditions will make a return with highs of 30 degrees Celsius. That's all for now and to the weather conditions around the world. And that is News Center for tonight. Thank you for watching and do stay safe. Welcome.
24시간 불이 꺼지지 않는 나라 감당할 수 있겠니? 한국에 오면 먹어야죠 먹어도 먹어도 끝이 없는 나라 감당할 수 있겠니? 그들이 원하는 영웅이 되줘야지. 없는 나라 감당할 수 있겠니? Welcome. Welcome. Hello everyone, it's Thursday and you're watching Within the Frame. I'm Kim Bo-kyung. 
Recent extreme heat is reducing worker productivity, putting stress on regional power grids and disrupting business continuity. It is causing the deaths of livestock and affecting vegetable crop yields, leading to inflation. It is even said that the climate crisis is going to reduce worldwide GDP by more than 17 percent by 2100. The ultimate answer would be to deal with climate crisis, but what can be done now to minimize the economic impact? For an in-depth analysis, we invite Professor Kim Sewan from Ihua Women's University. Professor Kim, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me today. Thank you for being with us. Now, we also have Mr. Shoro Dasgupta, an economist at the Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change. Mr. Dasgupta is also a visiting senior fellow at the Grantham Research Institute, London School of Economics and Political Science. Good to see you, Mr. Dasgupta. Uh, thank you for having me in the program. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure here, too. Now, Professor Kim, first question. Uh, extreme heat and unsafe working conditions are causing workers to go out on strike. And UPS and Amazon workers have already uh, reportedly staged industrial action asking for better working conditions. Now, could you tell us more about these workouts? Well, continuing heat waves in U.S. and Eurozone seriously worsen uh, working conditions up to up to unbearable level, uh, which leads to massive strikes of, of outdoor workers. As temperature goes above uh, 37 degrees in Celsius, uh, delivery workers in Amazon and UPS take uh, strikes for better working condition recently. The same is true for workers in Greece and Italy, outdoor workers. Uh, Italian construction workers demanded to work only after sunset in the evening. Actually, all workers in the whole world have their own right to pursue better working condition. Uh, as the heat wave attack, almost all countries' workers strike, workers strike uh, particularly outdoor workers who are directly exposed to danger of high temperature. Uh, this kind of strikes will be continued until September. Right, I see. So they are going on strikes because of the unbearable working conditions. Now, uh, Mr. Dasgupta, even if others do not take industrial action, many reports say, as our Professor Kim already pointed out, heat stress is very much linked to decline in productivity, especially in construction and agriculture sectors where outdoor workers are exposed to extreme heat. Now, could you give us details on how productivity is reduced? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. As the esteemed professor already said, climate change is, act is affecting the human right to safe and healthy working conditions, right? So heat stress results in increased risk of discomfort. Uh, it limits our physical functions and capabilities. It affects the way we work, the amount of effort we can put in, not just want to put in, but also ultimately it increases the risk of injuries and heat related illnesses such as heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and as we have seen in fatal cases, even death. In terms of productivity, heat stress or extreme heat reduces our performance during our working hours, right? When workers are under severe heat stress, they have to slow down and they have to take more breaks, especially as you mentioned in the agriculture and construction se uh, sectors to of course, rehydrate and cool down so that their health is not very adversely affected. Essentially, workers have to slow down to protect their health, which leads to declining productivity. Right, I see. Now, Professor Kim, we are mainly discussing declining productivity in sectors such as agriculture and construction, but I heard that employees working in an air-conditioned environment could also be affected by extreme heat. Is it right? Uh, that is true, Po Gyeong, uh, because we can't stay indoor forever, and all businesses are all, all businesses are highly intertwined, directly and indirectly. In the end, uh, the heat wave significantly increases all industry workers' death rate, and that also weakens all businesses' sustainability. Uh, quite a few economic institutions are warning that. Uh, economic damage uh, generated by extremely strong heat increases quickly. For example, one of the major uh, radiant companies, Moody's, uh, reports that this year's economic damage from the heat wave in the U.S. is expected to amount to $100 billion, or about 0.5 percent of total GDP. They further estimate that the economic damage from the heat wave rapidly increases up to over 2.3% of GDP until uh, 2050. 
that altogether uh, indicate the impact of heat wave is widespread over different industries with increasing uh, damages. Right. Well, we are going to tap on uh, Moody's report on the impact on the GDP. But before that, Mr. Dasgupta, heat waves can put stress on regional power grids and driving up the coast and availability of space cooling as well. How does this affect business continuity? Right. This is a vicious cycle. Extreme heat uh, has major consequences on our energy systems, so whether it's regional or interregional and so on. During heat waves, demand for air conditioning increases significantly, which results in surge demand for electricity, which can result in increased greenhouse gas emissions. Again, makes the world hotter, and you know the vicious cycle continues, higher demand for cooling. Now, when demand increases, electricity prices increases at the, uh, uh, as a consequence, right? But currently, with electricity prices already being elevated in many of the regions around the world due, due to the global energy crisis, businesses are facing higher operating costs, and which results in declining profits, and of course affects their continuity. We have seen in many, many parts of the world that this has be already become a reality. And the unfortunate issue is that this negative effects are only likely to become worse in terms of costs if uh, more condition if air conditioners are are not efficient as we have seen in countries such as bangladesh and india so it's it's not just a human issue it's also has huge negative impacts on business operations right i see it truly is a vicious cycle now uh, professor kim uh, continuing heat waves are also causing livestock deaths and affecting vegetable crop yields as well, prompting prices to skyrocket. How does that affect inflation? Uh, recent rise in the prices of meat, uh, fisheries and agricultural products quickly become, uh, became the largest threat in stabilizing inflation because these are the key items that mm -hmm. determine the general price level. Mm -hmm. As the heat wave, uh, dominate Korean Peninsula from last month, a great many livestock collapsed and died. Uh, chickens are particularly vulnerable uh, at, the heat, at the heat waves, so about a quarter million chickens collapsed over recent heat waves. That decreases supply and raises the price of the meats. Uh, prices of vegetables and fruits also highly increased due to limited supply by the heat waves. For example, the cabbage price increased by 90% uh, in a month, and other agricultural products prices are increasing together. And the problem is that uh, barely stabilized inflation uh, would be unstabilized due to the rising prices in the, in the meat, fisheries, and agricultural products. Last month, uh, domestic inflation was 2.3% on year, which is very close to central bank's inflation target of 2%. But thanks to price rise in, in meat and agricultural products, there will be a significant pressure on inflation by the end of the year. Right, so climate crisis is affecting inflation as well. Now, it is also affecting uh, the tourism industry. Now, Mr. Dasgupta, due to unprecedented weather anomalies, some parts of the globe that are heavily reliant on the tourism, such as uh, Southern European countries, are reportedly experiencing a sharp increase in cancellations of flights and accommodation reservations. How is climate change also affecting the tourism industry? Uh, so, you know, it used to be the case that we always wanted to go to hot parts of the world mm. during holidays, but it's just gotten too hot right now. Mm. And the tourism industry is highly vulnerable to climate change. As you mentioned, the data already suggests that an increasing number of tourists are adjusting their plans um, to not to face extreme heat. Uh, and this is the case in many Southern European and Mediterranean countries. They're changing their destinations or even delaying their trips. Um, I live in Venice. It's always a hot, you know, hot spot for tourism in the summer months. But I do feel that there are fewer tourists maybe now due to the July heat waves already. Um, and, and given the hot spot we are in, not just for tourism, but also for severe summer heat, uh, next prediction of future heat waves will are likely to be longer and more frequent and more intense. And given the space and trajectory of climate change and climate change induced heat waves, 
these uh, shifts in tourism are likely to become more common in the future. And we will likely see the number of tourists declining in southern European countries during the summer months. So they may switch uh, during other months of the year. But the entire industry uh, from Rome to Paris to Venice um, we will be we will be will become unstable at least in in the near term with the heat waves. Mm, right. I mean, due to all of this impact that we have talked about up until now, Professor Kim, Washington-based think tank uh, Atlantic Council estimated the total economic loss from heat in the U.S. to be at least 100 billion U.S. dollars annually, a figure that will increase fivefold by 2050 if we don't reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. How serious is this figure? Uh, as we talked about before, the economic damage of $100 billion uh, generated by heat wave is about 0.5% of U.S. GDP, uh, given that U.S. GDP is about $22 trillion as of 2022. Uh, so some might say that this economic loss is not much uh, compared to the seriousness of heat wave and the size of the U.S. economy. Uh, it shouldn't be uh, interpreted like that because even though the economic loss by the heat wave is focused on several outdoor sectors like construction and delivery, the impact is really widespread in the end. Mm -hmm. For example, if, if the uh, delivery business are stopped by the heat wave, that dismantles the fundamental flows of goods and services in the whole economy. And that finally gives a huge impact on the whole economy. And as the heat wave continues, this economic damage will be accumulated over different sectors of economy, which could be, uh, could be uncontrollable shock to the whole economy in the end. Right, I see. Now, Mr. Dasgupta, it is not just the U.S. we're talking about here. Moody's Analytics estimated that the chronic physical risk from heat stress could reduce uh, worldwide GDP by up to 17.6 percent by 2100, as uh, our Professor Kim has been keep talking about. What did you make of this forecast? Professor Kim already put this very succinctly. I'll, I'll expand only a little bit here. Mm -hmm. So climate risks affect the economy through a variety of channels. The, the, the transmission channels are are, uh, are, uh, are are rather broad right now, right? And in the U.S., it might be easier to estimate some of the damages. But if we think of it, extreme heat leads to chronic changes in living conditions affecting our health. We already talked about labor productivity, agriculture, ecosystems, sea level rise. So there are both damages to the flow, but also stock, let's say, of, uh, of human capital and for physical capital. Uh, and in low and middle income countries, these damages might be lower in terms of monetary damages, but the health and the well being damages are likely to be much higher. Um, and without strong mitigation efforts, these damages will continue to increase multifold, as the esteemed professor already mentioned. So we, we, we need to think about how cumulative these damages will be in low and middle income countries in terms of health and well-being and not just monetary losses. Right, I see. Uh, Mr. Dasgupta, one more question. Now, though the best solution would be tackling climate change itself, let's focus on what countries can do first. Now, to protect workers from extreme heat, the Biden administration announced in 2021 that the Occupational Safety and Health Administration would issue relevant regula regulations, but no draft has been released so far. What kind of regulations generally should be put in place? So, as, as I said in the beginning, climate change is affecting human rights of workers, mm. right? In many parts of the world, workers in the sectors that we've already discussed, agriculture and construction, are at increasing risk from heat waves. Yet, as you just mentioned, even in US, we do not we have we do not have sufficient health and safety protections. And even where we have such protections for labor to protect the labor force, enforcement is often weak. Even in high income countries such as the UK, we do not have a maximum temperature threshold to protect the workers. So in the short run, we can have, let's say, early warning systems to ensure that meteorological information is used for decision making. So if it's too hot to work outside, let's put a moratorium. 
on workers not working during the most high risk working hours, uh, especially during heat waves, right, that we have already mentioned. Workers might have to take additional breaks uh, when they work. They might have to change what they wear um, and increase their rehydration. But as we have seen over history, this must be mandated by the government. This cannot be left to the free markets. We might also need regulations uh, for changing working hours, providing access to cooling indoors, but also in the medium term, adjusting building designs, climate smart urban planning, and increasing mechanization of some tasks. To end, what we need is proactive labor protection policies that take into account local contexts and not just one size fits all type policies that do not help us at all. Uh, so it's, it's now about protecting rights of workers to safe and healthy working conditions that are required in all parts of the world. Right. There seems to be uh, many steps that we need to take to protect our workers. Now, Professor Kim, this, just, uh, this question just popped in my mind. Uh, how is the uh, situation in South Korea? And uh, I believe the business sector would be quite reluctant to, you know, better the working environment for workers because that all means money, right? How should this be dealt with? Well, as that's good to, uh, Dr. Baskuta pointed out, we do not have clear condition uh, over the heat waves for, for all the workers. Mm. So uh, we can see that quite a few outdoor workers in South Korea are suffering from uh, uh, really high, uh, massive heat waves uh, under construction and, and deliveries and so on. So it is very necessary to provide uh, for, provide the standard working condition under heat wave, but, which should be given exactly by uh, Korean government and Congress. Right, I see. Now, Professor Kim, not just for workers, there also needs to be a contingency plan in case climate crisis bring weather anomalies other than heat waves. What plans need to be made? Uh, it is almost true that uh, we will have a constant heat wave and weather anomalies uh, until excessive carbon dioxide emission uh, problem is fixed. Until then, uh, we do have to have a different level of uh, preparation for the weather anomalies like heat waves and floods. For that purpose, government should redesign all infrastructures in different standards of temperature and rainfall. For example, in, construct in constructing a airport, this intensified standard to avoid heat wave and flood damage should be applied. And all nationwide key infrastructures are needed to be updated quickly. It is a big and expensive project, but, but a necessary step to keep people in a safe environment. Right. We need to totally redesign the whole system. Now, Mr. Uh, that's Gupta. some experts say that governments should make efforts to convert the climate crisis into opportunities for so-called climate finance, enabling businesses to invest in new tech and industries and creating jobs. How should this be done? Oh, absolutely, completely agree with you. And boosting climate financing, especially for the private sector, is going to be key. It is going to be essential. Uh, and, and ensuring innovative financial institutes, access to innovative financial instruments can provide such incentives and opportunities, um, as, as you already mentioned. And, and, climate and enabling access to climate finance can speed up investments in sustainable and clean energy projects, among many other green projects. But what governments across the world needs to do is help the private sector to get access to such funds. This is, a, this is going to be a major boost, not just to tackle climate change, not just to tackle greenhouse gas emissions, but also to spur investment in green projects, in sustainable energy projects, and create many jobs. There will be millions of jobs created, uh, that will be created in the green sectors. This is a win-win opportunity, reduces negative impacts of climate change, and improves uh, economic conditions around the world. Now, governments can provide incentives, but at the same time, there needs to be regulations in place that strongly encourages businesses and private sector in general to invest in green projects, which will enable to get them to get access to further climate financing, but they must move away from polluting activities. This is absolutely necessary.
Right, I see. Mr. Dasgupta, one more question. Would there be any um, examples that uh, enabled uh, for the business sectors, private sectors, to be encouraged? Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act in the U.S. is a perfect example. Mm. It has already sparked investments. The billions of dollars of investments created hundreds of thousands of jobs. And the Biden administration stepped in and said, well, you'll get uh, incentives to invest in green projects, but you have to stop uh, your involvement in, in some of the more polluting activities. That's a perfect example, I would say. Right, I see. Now, Professor Kim, what's your view on this? How should the climate crisis convert it into climate finance? Well, all major countries have already decided to participate in decreasing carbon dioxide to control the weather uh, ultimately. And Korean government also is implementing a plan that decreases carbon dioxide emission by 40 percent until uh, 2030. In, in implementing this policy, I think it is very important to construct an efficient partnership between public and private sectors. Uh, and particularly, government should provide financial resources to private sectors' development of clean energy-based uh, technologies. Without developing this uh, e ecosystem between public sector and private sector and finance and manufacturing sectors, it would not be possible to have a new opportunities with, uh, I mean, business opportunities with clean energies. All right, I see. Well, unfortunately, this is all the time we have for today's edition. Well, thank you, Professor Kim and Mr. Dasgupta for your time and your insights. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. All right, that's all for Within the Frame tonight. We'll be back tomorrow with more in-depth stories. Thank you for watching and goodbye.